So hello everyone. I am delighted to be joined here live today with Laura Anderson Mancini. Pre-pandemic, Laura launched herself into the art world and spent her career in the arts as a performer, professional pilates and functional movement body worker, creating an art consultancy and as an international development manager for the Royal Academy of Dance. Laura has worked these last three years as a member of the Channel Island Integrative Health Alliance, which is, how do you pronounce that, Laura, sorry? Siha. Siha, yeah. with other health professionals, doctors and researchers, and as a freelance broadcaster, lobbyist and networker for an awakened world. She created three public conferences known as the COVID Con uh, Conversations, which were the inspiration for Dr. Tess Laurie to create the Better Way Conference in Bath last year, 2022. Laura was one of the organizers for the event and co-hosted panel three on activism alongside GB News journalist, Neil Oliver. Laura's new initiative is Universal Hug Day, which launches this year on April 1st, 2023. Welcome everyone to this conversation with Laura and thank you, Laura, for joining us today. It's a great pleasure. It's lovely to be here. Great. So the first question I always ask people when I do an interview is if you would like to share anything that you would like about your background. Um, but I think what's quite inspiring for people to hear is about what I call the awakening journey. So when, when did you realize that things are not the way that we've been told that they are? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? And, you know, I think um, as for many people, probably the real hit between the eyes came um, with uh, the lockdowns, with pandemic. It felt really, really, really wrong right from the beginning. And so once I realized that we were not being told what um, I felt was the truth, I think that, and I've said this many, many times, once your eyes are open, you can't close them again. And then for me, my nature has always been to ask questions and inquire. And of course, once you start doing that, then all the dots start to fall together. So um, I've probably always been a relatively intuitive, instinctive human being in terms of how I feel about things. Um, so although I haven't been awakened as some people have for decades, which I can only imagine must have been an extremely frustrating thing to live through when you're living in a world where most people are still fast asleep. And uh, maybe the gift of the pandemic has actually been the fact that it was uh, like a, a really fast awakening for many, many people. And I do believe that every single day now we are seeing uh, uh, an absolute, it's like the, the scales are falling from people's eyes all the time. And it's, it's, it's the most uh, wonderful thing to see, to see so many people starting to make that journey, as difficult as it may be as difficult as it may be. And I think it's interesting, I, I hear you talking about all the various different things that I've done. I'm like, oh yeah, I did do that. Oh yeah, I did that too, that's interesting. You know, it's like, it almost feels like lots of different lives that we've lived um, in training for this point. And that's how it feels. And, you know, if I look at the magnificence of what we have gained from the last three years, really, obviously the awakening for sure the other thing is the coming together of all these people who are starting to see the light for for want of another way of putting that and the the fabulous um, connections that are being made and of course the gift of things like this like zoom and the ability to communicate with people across the world i feel like it's that each one of us no matter what our our role might be in this is like a beautiful tapestry. And we're all starting to, to join the threads of that tapestry and sort of wrap it around the world. So that's kind of where I am now with this whole new event that I've got coming up. So, yeah. So it's certainly true for me that when I reflect on the different things that I've done in my life, how it feels like everything that I've done before now has, has been significant for what I'm doing now the skills that I've learned, all of those different things now have become important in uh, where we are today. 
Um, so you said, you know, that you were involved in the arts before, and we talked before we started recording about how you, uh, the journey that you've been on from um, the Better Way Conference, from the COVID conversations to now, mm. would you like to just speak a little bit about how the journey that you've been on has taken you from maybe not being awake and aware, if you want to say it like that, to COVID conversations, to bringing people together and then to where we are right now? Yeah. Um, maybe, I don't know whether it's a flaw or a blessing, but when I see and see and hear things are, are wrong, I have to say something. And uh, not being allowed to say anything made me want to say something even more. And there I was sitting on this small island, 65, well, 65,000 people on uh, you know, an island which is 25 miles round, where we were obviously locked down like everybody else. Um, but I thought, well, actually, here's the thing. We've got 90% vaccination rate on this island, although it wasn't initially when we first started doing the COVID conversations, but as, you know, as it all started rolling out, that's where we got to. And I thought, well, this is a really interesting demographic. Um, I think we could start to show patterns here faster, almost than anywhere else. So um, I started by setting up COVID Conversations 1 with my, this wonderful group of doctors, including Dr. Scott Mitchell, who actually resigned from his post in emergency when the rollout of the vaccines to the 12 to 15 year olds was put in place. So he, he you know, he stepped across the line at that point, which I have great respect for him. Um, and he had been in contact with Tess Laurie, Dr. Tess Laurie. So um, through him, I contacted Tess and I said, Tess, this is what we're gonna do. I appreciate you can't come onto the island because we're all kind of locked down here, but would you appear online? And uh, Nick Hudson from Panda was another one of the speakers and also a psychologist from Australia who was basically about to have her license taken away for being so outspoken about what she was seeing happening. Um, so the three of them came together uh, in, we were in person in, in uh, I think there were probably the first COVID conversations about 200 people there. And we watched uh, them presenting online from their various different parts of the world. And it kind of shook Guernsey in a really interesting way. Uh, the state's members have always sort of stepped across the other side of the road when they see me coming. They're like, oh dear, she's going to ask an uncomfortable question. But, you know, um, they, need, they need to be held to account. We held them to account right from September 2021. So wanting to keep the momentum of that going on the 15th of November 2021, we did the second one. And at that we had uh, Richard Tice from the Reform Party because he'd been out filming a lot of the uh, freedom marches. He got a helicopter and he did these amazing videos. And I thought, yeah, people don't even know that these are happening. I mean, you'll all remember that. You know, we had hundreds of thousands of people walking through the main cities of our world and nobody was being able to see it because they were all watching mainstream media, which we'll come on to later, no doubt. But um, so that was uh, Richard Tice. We had Nick Hudson there again with his beautiful, eloquent way and wisdom and uh, Ros Jones from uh, Heart. And obviously, as an ex-pediatrician there, she was very, very concerned about the vaccination rollout for children. So that was the second one. And then the third one we had on the second of the second 22. And this time, Tess said, I'm coming. So she actually turned up. We had Matt Letissier there, who's our local uh, Guernsey lad. Well, not he's not a lad, he's my age now, but, you know, um, obviously a very famous footballer. And of course, he's just, he's just, uh, he's just gone viral now. He's, he's all over the world talking about this. He's just magnificent to me, that man. Um, so we had Matt Letissier, Peter McCullough came online. Uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Yoho, Yo, Yoho sorry, who's um, talked a lot about uh, corruption in pharmaceutical trade for many years, and our very own cardiologist, Guernsey cardiologist, uh, Dr. Dean Patterson, and he interviewed a very brave young man who'd been vaccine injured on the island, and he came forward and he spoke, um, and I know that Dean has now become very, very active himself. 
along with Dr. Asim Malhotra and, and others of his kind in really speaking out about what they're seeing now and the danger of the vaccines. So that's kind of where all that happened. And then when Tess was out there in Guernsey with me, she said, Laura, we need to do this in the UK. I want to do this, will you help me do this? And we did. So the Better Way Conference then happened. Wow, that was just an explosion of wonder. You know, we had suddenly all these people who maybe had never actually met in person all coming together. And my favorite story from that uh, event was, uh, so yes, I had Neil Oliver there as my co-host on the, the activism panel. And well, he's actually going to be hosting the entire event this next year, uh, this one, which is uh, coming up in June. Um, so I'm I'm thrilled about that. He He was just, he was blown away by that conference. He said to me as he left at the end of the conference, Laura, he said, these two days have literally changed my life. And I think a lot of people felt that. We felt the, the, the incredible energy in the room. And maybe that's where I have now come to with this. There was such love. There was such authenticity. There was such genuine compassion and drive. And in these people, they will not be silenced. They, will, they have a, an incredible integrity. And it was just a magnificent thing to be part of. But what I loved also was the fact that there's no ego. There's no hierarchy there. So here's my favorite story. Uh, Dr. Robert Malone and Neil Oliver are the two players in this journey. And so I'd sat with Neil Oliver. We had this lovely reception for all the speakers to meet one another before um, the Saturday day of the conference. And um, I was sitting with Neil slightly off where the main uh, party was happening because we were swapping notes on what was going to happen on this activism panel the next day. And Neil's sitting there, you know, he's beautiful. He's like, oh, oh he's, he's, I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed. There's just so many famous people here. I was laughing. I was like, mm, you're quite famous, but anyway. Um, and then I could see out of the side of my eye, um, Robert Malone striding towards us with his arm reached out. And he grabbed hold of Neil's hand and he shook it vigorously. He said, oh, Neil, he says, I'm so pleased to meet you. You're like the king of Scotland. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I love this. You know, they were just all so excited to meet one another. And that is, for me, what this is all about. And, you know, anybody who was um, lucky enough to actually physically be at that conference last year would have felt that. The, uh, even the security guards by the end, do you remember that, Rabita? They were hugging one another. I mean, I've never been in an event where the security guards have hugged one another. But So it really was, for me, a massive transitional moment. We, shaped, we shook things at that, at that event. And of course, now it's like you drop um, a grain of, of sand into the water and the water just starts to ripple. And of course, we've now got all these beautiful... Um, amazing things happening off the back, not obviously just of the better way, but of all of the events that happened with these people and other people of their ilk around the world, which is where we are now. And so, yes, we, we, we've kind of got to move beyond it, I feel. Although we must not forget, we must let go. And that's a very, very different thing for me. If we still hold on to these narratives too tightly, um, it takes us down with them. And I feel very strongly about that. And that doesn't mean to say that there aren't doctors there who are, who are absolutely doing the right thing by, by holding all the data, by gathering all the data and sharing all of those on their sub stacks and everything else. But as with all of the narratives, whether it be war, whether it be climate, whether it be COVID, whatever it might be, we must not engage with them so much that it starts to affect who we are, because that is what's happening. That's what's happening, not just in the collective of people who may be totally unaware, really, of what's going on, but even in the awakened group, this is a problem now. People are getting too wrapped up, too focused. I was. And I realized that my heart would get really, really tight. And I realized, you know, as a body worker, as a Pilates instructor, that this was, you know, I'm not breathing. Laura, you're not breathing. You've got to stop it. But there was that feeling, that urgency that we needed to be out there. We needed to be speaking. We needed to be sharing all of this material. And we had to shake people because otherwise it was going to be too late. 
But when it comes to it, and this is the point that I have reached, I have understood that people are going to wake up now because it's all coming tumbling out. And us as individual broadcasters, speakers, yes, okay, we have a role. Maybe that's why we were, that's why we're here, maybe. But we need to start sharing joy, peace, love, compassion for everyone. And here's the point, even those perpetrators who have done this to us, because it is not our place to take them to, to task. And, you know, that's a big thing for me to have come to, whereas last year I was like, waving my my stick at the better way conference and you know talking about um totalitarianism and so yes it's been a a massive shift towards towards working on my inner being and how do we do that well why the universal hug day came as an idea by one of my great friends and mentors jamie lowe Jamie said, Laura, if we don't open people's hearts, if we don't get people to start to work from a heart place rather than an ego place and the mind driven place, which is where so many of us have been literally our entire lives. We're never going to shift anything. We're just going to keep going. These narratives are just going to keep sucking us in and look how more and more ridiculous these narratives have got. It's just an extraordinariness now. Yet people, some are still going with it because they're still engaged with mainstream media. They're still engaged with all of these things. So you hug someone. And this is maybe your next question to me. When you hug someone, and particularly when you go heart to heart, and isn't that interesting that we all tend to go the other way? It's like, oh my gosh, we've even been taught to do that wrong. <laughs> you know? You know, if you go heart to heart, you have a really interesting connection with that other being. And if you hold that person for seven seconds or 10 or 30, or even a minute, obviously with their permission, otherwise that could get a little bit funny, um, the feeling grows. The heart opens more, not just in the person receiving the hug, but in you too. So this becomes an incredibly powerful thing. If you think about the fact that we walk through our day, most of it unconscious, most of it, we're just automatic. We're just being driven by whatever we feel we need to be doing. We need to be, you know, using our phones or, you know, looking at emails or rushing here, there and everywhere. We are not conscious. So what we now need to do is we need to become conscious beings. We need to realize that it's about focusing from the right place and letting the ego mind take a rest. It's not supposed to be our master. It's supposed to be our slave. And unfortunately for many, many of us, and I speak as one very guilty of this, it, it can creep in very, very easily. So that is kind of where I have got to on my journey. It's been a long journey. It's been very convoluted, but uh, maybe it has been for all of us in different ways, you know. There's a few different directions I could go now. Uh, Lara asked which island you were uh, living on when the COVID conversation started. So Lara, Guernsey um, was uh, COVID free at one point and everybody was patting themselves on the back and the public health director Nicola Brink was just, you know, she was given an MBE for her role in, uh, in saving Guernsey. But um, of course, it's easy to close down a small island but at some point, you've got to open it again. So what happens? <laughs> it starts coming in. So then we were totally the same as everywhere else. Um, but it was just a very interesting place to be because everybody really did feel like, well, we can trust our public health people because they're telling us absolutely the right thing. And of course, they weren't. They were just following the narrative that was being fed to them by uh, the public health authorities and the governments. And as we know, the main driver in that is the pharmaceutical industry. So. There we go. So before we go on to what you've just shared about kind of the direction now that we should be focusing on and how the Better Way Conference introduced a real physical connection um, 
you know, the egos were taken out of the equation. It was unifying around uh, solutions and a better way. Um, there might be some people who are coming across this video as we go through these stages, that first stage being that cognitive dissonance, um, the, the, the realization still going through that kind of trying to trying to figure out what exactly has just gone on over these last three years. So I was just wondering if you could quickly share, because I, I want to focus on the, mm. on the on where we're going. What was what came to light back in 2021 with the COVID conversations um, and then what changed with the content then at the Better Way conference back in uh, May? 2022? I think initially there was just out, it was more outrage, wasn't it? You know, we, we were locked down. We were put, told to put masks on. We were told that we were going to lose our jobs if we didn't get vaccinated. We were, um, we were turned into a pariah, you know, it, my goodness. I remember, um, so the first event, they really tried very hard not to let it happen. Um, and then when it came to me putting on the second event, we were actually cancelled from the location that I had booked for it. So uh, this was the Performing Arts Centre, which is the biggest uh, theatre space in Guernsey, sitting about 450 people. And so I knew the um, guy who, who runs it, this really lovely man, um, and I messaged him and I said, look, I'm putting on this event. Are you happy for us to put it on here? And he went, yep, that's great. OK, so we'd started the whole conversation and then it went really quiet. And I thought, OK, I know what's going to come now. And then he sent me an email and he said, I'm really sorry, Laura. I feel really compromised, but I've been told um, that I'm not allowed to let you host this. Now, this is a government owned property. So, of course, I knew that he'd had the pressure. I didn't blame him. I understood that he had no choice but to, to give me that directive. But what was, was really interesting with that was two things. One, I found uh, St. Peter Port and St. Pierre Park Hotel, who were fabulous and opened their doors to us. And in we went and we hosted something which was just as big. We had uh, 400 people there. I had people contacting going, Laura, can I actually contribute to the, covering the costs for you? Because we were just kind of doing it. I, you know, we were just making it up as we went along, a bit like Universal Hug Day. You know, I'm not backed by anybody for these things. I go, right, OK, I'm going to do this. And I'm sure the universe is just going to. And it always has. So that's a very interesting thing. So we, we got um, sponsorship, two different sponsors for COVID Conversations 2 and 3. And um, so my, I had no issue with costs and people were turning up for that event purely because I'd been cancelled. I love this because nobody would ever been cancelled. No event had ever been cancelled. And we'd had some pretty highly controversial conversations going on in that space over the years. And it was the same for Tess, by the way, with Better Way Conversations. Uh, Better Way last year, she booked uh, the assembly rooms in Bath and they did the same thing. They got so much pressure put on them by powers that be that they contacted her and they said, we're really sorry, Tess, but we can't um, have you use this space. So, of course, we were all in a flurry of crikey. What are we going to do? We're all looking for alternative venues. And then, of course, she did. She found this new venue and uh, she said, all right, we might need to compromise the size slightly because they could only provide half of the space to us. But again, the universe provided because what then happened as we got closer to the event is the, the conference that had been booked for the space upstairs cancelled and they just offered us the whole thing for the same price so it is that whole thing of you you go all right I'm not quite sure how this is going to happen but I'm just going to throw myself in there with the right intentions let's see what manifests and you know what it happens and it's happened every single time because the intention is coming from the right place and this is what people need to learn to do they need to learn as uncomfortable as it may be they need to learn to trust and to start listening to their intuition. I don't know absolutely. if that your Yeah, question. no, absolutely. I am a big advocate of following your intuition mm. and connecting to what I would say is the subconscious. 
Yeah. Um, but absolutely. And when we do that, I believe if we can learn to connect to the intuition, that that intuition will keep us safe and guide us through whatever is coming next. So when people say to me, you know, which country should I live in? Where, where should I go? And so just learn to connect to your intuition and that will keep you safe. Yes. And, and I think, um, I can't quite remember where I was going to go with that, but uh, yeah, the intuition is just, it's vital. It's vital. Oh yes, that's where I was going to go with that. We have, because of the sort of society that we live in, the sort of education that we were brought up with, we have been led to believe that we must follow certain news channels, certain newspapers, um, we must trust our governments. We've, we've just been educated into this. But what has happened and is happening now, probably every hour, maybe every moment around the world, is people are realizing that those institutions um, and journalists that they trusted were not telling them the truth. There was a lot of inversion going on because they're not allowed to. These, uh, Bill Gates has funded a lot of the media by $319 million. You know, these places are bought. And people, once they start to understand that that is what they are listening to day in, day out, do you remember in the middle of the COVID times, you'd have the TV on and, you know, you go into cafes or, or, or you'd be sitting at home because you weren't even allowed to go into the cafe and you'd have a number of COVID cases would be up on the corner of the screen in the, in the newsrooms as they're talking, almost like a sort of a bingo number. You know, this is designed to terrify people, nothing more than that. Nothing more. So if you want to, to be able to enter that place of intuition, then turn your TV off. So, you know, if I want to give people advice on how to just be, as and by the way, that can be really uncomfortable when people are first starting, but it's the observation of how you feel. If you just do it to start with, just for even just a few minutes, Take yourself away. Take yourself away from your devices. Turn them off completely. Take yourself outside. Go into nature. Hug your dog. Hug your gran. Whatever that might look for, like for you, try it. And then notice how you feel. Because once you make that observation, then you realize that actually you are in control of how you can be, not somebody else. And that's the other thing that we've been trained to do. If we're poorly, we go to the doctors. If we have a, a problem, if we're struggling with something, we go to a psychologist. Why? We have all of these things inside us and we actually have all the answers inside us, but we've been so shut down from it, we don't realize we do. And it's what's, you know, they always say like the best inventions are the simplest. This is exactly a case in point. It is absolutely true. We just need to drop all of the cacophony of things that we've wrapped our lives in and step away and stand in nature or just breathe, focus on your breathing. You don't even need to book a meditation class. Maybe that might follow because that's what happens. Once you understand how it feels, when you are away from these things and you realize that your stress levels are starting to drop again, uh, then you want a bit more of that. You know, so then you start your journey. That's how you do it. It doesn't happen. Yeah. And once you've experienced that drop in the stress levels, you realize then how stressed you were before. But you have to give it a go first to feel that change, to know what the difference is. Precisely. And what's magnificent with it, and I'm sure you'll resonate with this, Rubito, is you almost don't recognize yourself. You realize you've become someone different because you have literally become someone different because you've changed your brain chemistry. Just like, you know, if you, if you work on your body, you change how your brain associates with, with your muscles. You change your posture. You change. It's exactly the same principle. You know, we have it all there. So 
COVID conversations, obviously, back in 2021, were already highlighting, for example, you, you mentioned that the one of, there was COVID conversations one, two, and three. One of those, you already had somebody vaccine injured on there. So the, 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 the problems you talked about, you know, how we were locked down, how we were being, it was being dictated to us what we can and can't do. So that was that was back in 2021. Then if we take your story as the example of the awakening, in 2022, we had the Better Way Conference, people coming together, um, physically meeting together, talking about solutions, connection. And now we're talking about how the focus now needs to be on um no longer on the problems but now on the solutions um what about people out there that are saying yeah universal hug day we've got lawsuits to carry out we've got people to fight we've got uh, things to worry about uh, bunkers to start preparing <laughs> <laughs> How is this going to help? What would you say to people about, you know, how is a universal hug day going to help us? How can we um, cope with any of these horrors that they are trying to suggest to us? By the way, I don't really think that many of these things are, are going to be a thing. But, you know, they are determined to drip feed uh, the fear into us. Um, how are we going to cope with any of these bigger issues coming if we are not prepared ourselves? Because what's happening, there are two things happening here. Yeah. You've got, it's like, if you've got two groups of people, you've got people who are becoming more and more conscious, who are recognizing that they need to do the inner work, who are realizing that they must not engage. And by the way, that doesn't mean to say that I'm not informed about all these narratives. I'm very informed about all these narratives. But I do choose not to engage with them to the point where they stress me out anymore. Because if we allow that to happen, that's what's happening to this other group. You can see them literally starting to sink under the water. So what's this role? What, what, what are these people for? These people are to catch these ones. That's our role, that's our job. And you can choose which of those to be on. I know where I am. That's where I, I strive for every day, every moment, actually. And this is the thing, it's not easy. It's not easy, it's like, I have made this decision, right? Okay, happy, I'm so happy, I'm just gonna go sit under a tree. That's not how it works. But if you're allowing yourself to be so terrified and you've got your spade out and you're digging your bunker, there is a great chance you won't survive very well with this. And that is the, the great sadness of this point. But, and I've said this before, if you imagine it's like we're all on this great long runway, like, um, you know, in the travel, in the airports, you have the travelators, we're all on it. And we can't get off. You can try, <laughs> you can try you can go and jump off and try and hide in your bunker, but actually you can't get off because we're all going to realize the truth in the end. So you can try as hard as you like, and that's what a lot of people are, are doing at the moment, aren't they? They're, they're trying to make themselves feel better. They're booking holidays, they're, but they're getting their hair cut, they're changing their partners, they're changing their jobs, whatever it is that they're trying to do to make themselves feel a little bit better. But I've got news for you guys. It's not going to work, and they know it. It doesn't help because you can't get off the travelator. So with that knowledge, with that inner standing, you go, all right, my choice now is that I have to start to open my eyes to what is actually happening and learn to cope with it. How do I cope with it? I learn to, to find that I'm working from a different place, not from my fight and flight. My ego is only ever supposed to support us in points of survival mode. If we've got somebody physically attacking us, 
Our brain needs to kick in and we need to sort that out. But we shouldn't be in that mode all the time, which is where so many people, and they're the ones digging the bunkers, are right now. So that's it. I, I have this visualization of this, this travelator. It's a bit like, I used this analogy the other day in a, in a little podcast, a little video that I did. It's like, you know, if you think about a caterpillar, I love the visualization of the caterpillar metamorphosizing into a butterfly. Now, a caterpillar doesn't go to a psychologist to discuss how they're going to possibly cope with getting themselves into this cocoon and the terror that they have in change in shape shifting into this butterfly, which will be unbelievably beautiful, but possibly won't live very long. They don't have any of that process. They accept their evolution. It's just what happens. And yet people cannot do that or they refuse to do that. So what has to happen here is that people need to just give in. They have to go, all right, I'm out of aces here. I've realized that I and my brain cannot fix this and nobody can fix it for me. And that's a great society we have, isn't it? Or oh, can, you, can you give me some more pills to help me with this? Or can you, uh, whatever, it's a fixer society and it doesn't, it's broken. And it's becoming more and more apparent all the time that that is where we are. And that is why Tess, with The Better Way this year, if you look at what they are now starting to, to present, what they're talking about, they've got Vandana Shiva on there, they've got all these people who are like, these people are so thrillingly exciting. You know, it's all about, wow, you know, we're going to create a sustainable future based on real things, based on integrity, based on community. We've all been separated. The pandemic was a magnificent, they did a great job on us. How to separate everybody, how to make everybody feel completely isolated. I remember Rainer Fulmich telling a story about uh, this German doctor who'd been standing in a queue in the middle of every, you know, the pandemic when everybody's still masked up, the doctor was not wearing a mask. The woman in front of him uh, in this queue turned around and gave him a really, really hard time. She said, don't you realize that you are endangering me and my husband is extremely sick and you're potentially killing him by standing there without that mask. And what did the doctor do? He reached over very gently and he took her mask off and he gave her a hug and she broke down. And she looked at him and she said, you're the first person to touch me for a whole year. And that's not uncommon. And that was the greatest tragedy, was it not? We can all think of scenarios where children didn't manage to hug their grandparents before they passed away. And all of that that happened, all of it. We need connection. We are designed to be in community. We are not designed to be soul traders. It's not how we are. And we know that because we feel so much better when we're in that place. You know, here I am up in Italy now. I'm part of the community, you know, and that's what's beautiful about the, so many of, uh, of these places around the world that people are starting to go, do you know what? That's it, I'm dropping that. I don't need to go and, and work in an office and get gray because the air conditioning is blasting at me all day and I haven't seen sunlight for whatever. Um, it's not altruistic to do these things. It's actually where we are better designed to be. You know, we're not designed to be enslaved into a system which doesn't actually really, it's not our friend. So there, there is, and again, I can use this comparison. It's like you've got these, these governmental um, and sort of uh, big corporations and things that have held this, this world up over the last however many centuries, particularly in the last few years, it's become more and more, and they're still pushing it, aren't they? You know, if, they, if you look at the, uh, the digital currencies, you know, the, the centralized uh, finance, they're trying to do the, uh, the oh, digital IDs. I mean, you name it, they are at it. They're doing a good job on us right now. Electric cars, they can switch all of those off. At the flick of a switch, we'd all be stuck. We wouldn't be able to get where we wanted to. I mean, you know, the story, and, and again, you know, those narratives can go on, right? So on one hand, you've got this going on. And on the other hand, you've got these uh, fantastic 
uh, groups, and, and Vandana Shiva is a, is a perfect example of that, who are creating the, the, they are enabling people to become educated and understand how they can survive in a different way, off this, away from it, away from this. So then what happens as this starts to tumble, as the, as, you know, the various different narratives of it start to collapse, the financial system, we're, we're watching it, it's, it's happening in, in warp speed now, this starts to grow. It's the same in the medical industry, as the faith in allopathic medicine and hospitals and doctors as they have stood starts to break down, which it is, there are lots of other programs that are now being uh, introduced. There was a fantastic talk by the wellness company, which is uh, spearheaded by Peter McCullough in America um, on the World Council for Health Assembly a few weeks ago. This is a company that's been made, it's made up of doctors who have stepped away from that system and they're going, I'm not doing that anymore. We are going to actually provide health. This is this was our Hippocratic Oath. We're actually going to do this now. Great. This is fabulous. So they're, they're, they have encompassed nutritionists, um, homeopaths, chiropractors, you name it. They're all working in this one umbrella organization. And then the person can step in through the door. They can pay a subscription for their services and they can get the entire thing. Now, that sort of template is going to roll out across the world. It already is starting to happen. So it is, it's like a rebirth. So I'm not at all scared about what they are trying to, to throw at us because I can see the, the thrill and the excitement and the intention. And that's a really important word, intention of these people that are now building these, this other way. And it's a very thrilling place to be. I'm actually extremely excited. And I have to tell you all that probably this is the most, well, it is, it's the most exciting time to be a human being on, on this planet. It may not feel like it sometimes, but it absolutely is. I agree with everything you are saying 100% um, or even more than that. I've always, uh, I've often said, for example, the the first thing that anybody can do is turn off the television going back to what you were saying before and i talk about you know polar opposites we live in a world of duality so we have positive and negative and as the negative increases the positive will also increase and when you're talking about the crumbling um i think this is really their last stand they're throwing it all out there because they can see the potential of humanity and it won't work for them because as it as you said as it crumbles there's going to be more people waking up more people uniting and those people that have already started it are going to be hi guys look what's going on over here and they will have those alternatives um, in place you can comment on that if you would like what i'd like to ask you also is um, what should we be focusing on now? You've touched own, on it. Our own journey. So you've talked or you've talked about the inner work. Um, anybody who's here can ask questions at the end, but I will just read a quick comment from Michael. He's put, I believe the divine plan has been for us to reconnect with each other, regardless mm -hmm. of distance and build the new earth for our future. Um, he then goes on a bit more esoteric, as we agreed in our past life, in our past before this incarnation. Um, focusing on, so because you mentioned before on how, yes, we need to stay informed, but now we need to be putting our focus and our attention on uh, what we would like to create. Um, so the inner work, you've talked about how to connect to intuition, how to connect to the breath, turning off the TV, things like that. Um, what would be your advice, though, for people that are still struggling in these times, worried about these times, worried about the changes that might come ahead? Um, what, what, if you met someone who was 
you know, sitting there worried, crying about the future, what would be your advice for that person, uh, next steps that they could take? I mean, obviously I've had this many times. I've had people in, a, in, in terrible places coming and talking with me. Um, and compassion is extremely important at this point because it's not their fault. You know, it's not their fault that they're in that place. And I think um, there has been a lot of, you know, if I look at the vaccine injured, for example, not, not a topic that I, uh, I feel very happy about um, prolonging anymore, but they are so there, there are so many and broken. I don't know if you've seen John Watt, I think maybe he would be a good example. Here's, this is how I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to use John Watt. John Watt in the Better Way conference, he just produced a video of himself and his friend. Um, they were so badly vaccine injured. John just wanted to kill himself. He was at the end of his point. He couldn't even get out of bed. He made this video, which was probably the most powerful video of vaccine injured that I had seen at that point. And it really deeply moved me. Um, now, so this is a year on, John Watt is standing up outside the BBC headquarters on the stage with Mark Sharman, the Sky and ITV X. Uh, in the Truth Be Told campaigns up there with Matt Letizier, they're all up there. John's up there. No matter how broken you may feel, you can always build yourself back up again because that brokenness is just a moment in your time. It's not, it does not define you. So I would say to the person who's sitting in front of me broken, that yes, okay, that's where you are. But until you are completely broken open, you do not grow. You can't learn. And I've and this again, I took we talked earlier about you know why why we're sitting here, why you and I and many others are now doing this. It's like we've been in training, you know. And the trauma and difficulties that I have encountered in my life have been my greatest gifts. And for that, I thank them. At the time, I couldn't begin to even understand sometimes how I would take my next step, but I did. And then I realized that if I hadn't had those experiences, I wouldn't be talking to you now like this. So everybody needs to be broken open. Just like the chrysalis has to be broken open for the butterfly to come out. Sorry, I was on mute. I also, I was fine listening to you and then I saw one or two people um, here getting a bit emotional as you were just speaking there. And then I started to get a bit emotional myself. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I've shared many times, I grew up with suicidal ideation and, um, and I had to go through that um, to, uh, to, to work out and figure out for myself how to do the inner work, how to get into a state where I feel happy and at peace with myself. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, we can start wrapping this up uh, in a moment and open it up to questions. I'm sure the people here will have lots of questions to ask. Um, I, I want to ask a, a kind of a, maybe possibly a little bit more challenging one just to finish, because you mentioned in the interview that we should have compassion even for those people that have carried this um, this out. And before you were you were perhaps more focused on the um, tyrannical, uh, approaching a tyrannical situation. How can we marry that? How can we come to, how can we find, how can we reach that level or that point in our understanding? Oh, I'm a great believer in karma. I've seen it over and over and over again. If we understand we're one of collect, we are one, you know, as a collective, we're all one and the same thing. We've got light, we've got dark, all of us, by the way. 
So those people who are currently presenting, who are playing this, this and it's dark. I mean, I'm not even gonna go there. We know, you know, about uh, child abuse. We know what's going out there in the world. There is some deeply dark stuff going on, but without the shadow, you do not have the light. And that's the really interesting point. If you imagine, if you were standing in a room, okay, you're, one, you're up against one wall, and you've got a light right at the other end of that wall, or on the other side, yeah, you're facing it. If you go too close to the light, it's all dark. You have to stand in the middle to understand what's going on. We would not know how deeply asleep mankind has been had it not been for these players. That's a really difficult thing to say, isn't it? And that's possibly going to upset some people, but it's true. It's true. And that doesn't mean to say that they're not going to get their comeuppance. They will. But it's not for me to do that. You know, and there was a point where, yeah, I could quite happily have gone out and I don't know, because I just I I. I couldn't believe it. I'm listening to them, listening to the words coming out of their mouths. I'm listening to the, the stories that I hear about, you know, uh, terrible things. But it's not my place because it would affect me and it would affect the collective if, if I stepped out into a place of, of vengeance because then I become no better than them. You know, and that's the same for, you know, people who may have hurt me in the past. If I do that back to them, I am no better than them. It just continues. It feeds it. We keep feeding the beast. We need to stop. We need to change the way we are behaving. And, and it's as simple as that. Really. Yeah, I say that, you know, there's a Gandhi said, be the change. I say, be the example of the world that we want to be. It sounds much more manageable and doable than be the change. Be Let the your life be like a moving prayer. Yeah. I love that. I also maybe just quickly mentioned, because I love this study, there was a study done maybe one or two years ago, a recent study I've forgotten with Dr. Robert Lanza was one of the authors. It's a quantum mechanics study that uh, he uh, suggests that um, it is the collective worldview that is manifesting the reality that we see here today. Absolutely. Well, so if we want a different reality, we need to change our worldview. And that is why the hug day could be the flip. Because can you imagine? And by the way, okay, it's on, and I'll tell you for why it's on the 1st of April in a moment. Yeah. But if you got everybody hugging and feeling that heart space on the same day around the world, you'd shift this in an instant. And the idea is to get people to, to grasp hold of the concept of having a hug day, but make it an everyday hug day, not just a one day a year hug day. This is the, the beginning of a new way of being. That is the concept of it. Yeah. The 1st of April was chosen because of course it's, uh, it's April Fool's Day. But did you know that April Fool's Day was created when the Gregorian calendar came out and they shifted when um, the beginning of the year was. So it became the 1st of January, but it was always the beginning of spring. That was the new year. And what they did to stop people from celebrating it is they turned it into a fool's day to make them look like idiots. We've been so inverted, we've been so lied to on every single possible thing that you can imagine. It is an incredible thing when you start to realize. But that is why we chose that day. Yeah. But it's just the beginning of something that we would love people to just embrace and continue. But yeah, get out there on Saturday. Hug everybody. I mean, we're, in, we're down in Hyde Park. We're, we're at Speaker's Corner, 11 o'clock till 3 on Saturday with our Hug Me t-shirts. And we've got Hug Me on the front 
And I've got scan me on the back because uh, that's to our website, which is the universalhubday.com website. And that people can start to really start to, to, to listen and read a little bit about what I've been talking about. You know, um, we may be just three people. We may be 300, maybe 3000. We might get shut down. I'd love that, it'd be great. You know, let's cause, let's cause a, 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 not a, a, a protest, but a, you know, a, uh, a sit-in or a, you know, <laughs> like a peace upon whatever you want to call that but you know uh, it's just got to happen right and you've got to just go out there and and uh, be a little bit brave sometimes open yourself there i'm going to squeeze in a last question so you mentioned oh that you know when i look back the journey that i've been on and i started off by saying that you uh launched Laura launched herself into the art world. Creativity, the importance of creativity now on creating what we want. You know, as you just said, we've been so manipulated in yeah. every single area of our lives. How exciting and how wonderful if we focus now on our own creativity and how we can express that for something better. Absolutely true. And, you know, I, you're right. I, I, my parents were artists. Um, I've been surrounded and immersed by very sensitive, creative people my entire life. The dancers were an inspiration to work with. And that's how we're all supposed to be. But we were kind of is putting the curriculum somewhere down below everything else. You gotta do your maths, you gotta do your English, you gotta do your science, and you gotta do, get a proper job. What? What does that actually mean? You know, but we're all creative in one way or another. We need, allowed, need to be allowed to, to, to feel that. We can all dance, we can all sing, we can all enjoy music and we can enjoy watching dancers. But you know, the freedom, and you look at uh, around the world, look at all the beautiful dance traditions there are and the tribal dances and you know, the freedom that it gives you, joy of movement, you know, we've, we've forgotten. People are too terrified of judgment to get up on a dance floor. Come on. You know, that's how we're supposed to be. So we need to reconnect with all of those things. Take yourself out of your comfort zone and really start to feel comfortable, interestingly, you know. Laura, thank you so much for this interview. In the description, there will be the links to uh, every... Uh, Universal Hug Day and other places where people can find you. Would you just like to share any links um, that you would like to share now? Yes, I mean, I mentioned before www.universalhugday.com. Um, that's the best one to go to because you can then search through lots of the other links, but we're on Telegram as well. You can search us under Universal Hug Day, Instagram also, and Facebook, Universal Hug Day. So please do. Yeah, and maybe just I'll quickly just say, do uh, ask, do you know what your next project is going to be, or is that going to manifest itself following this? Who knows? How exciting! <laughs> I tell you what, let's see what happens on Saturday. Um, I'm going to help Tess with Better Way again this next year, um, this in the next coming months, just to help them sort of put it together. Um, I, I just I am sitting up here in the, in the middle of the Tuscan countryside as part of a community that is flourishing here. Um, and I am really inspired with the idea of, you know, and the people that are coming. You know, you've got agri uh, permaculture specialists, quite a few doctors actually coming up just to see what that's looking like. So, yes, I suppose I would love to say that I will be throwing my energies towards whatever projects people want to throw at me in terms of creating a new world in whatever platform. It's, it's that whole thing of kind of, you, you know, your skill set. And um, yeah, that's really is it. I, I intend to really just immerse myself in, in all of the right things and continue with the inner work and to continue sharing the word but in a very, very loving way. You're very welcome to share your creativity on the Conscious Peoples Network with us as well.
Thank you so much for joining us today for this interview. It's been absolutely fabulous. It's a great pleasure. And thank you for inviting me, Rabita. And if anybody wants to get in contact with me directly, you can email me on universalhugday at gmail.com. Yeah, so that's a link that you can uh, go to there. I'm very happy to, to share and chat and you know, be of any help. If anybody wants to put any events on, because of course that is something that we're really trying to encourage people to do, maybe small, it might be in your sitting room, it doesn't matter, you know, um, Universal Hug Day events. If you go to the website, you'll see there's a template for the t-shirts, so you can just um, print them out yourself, get them done at a local place. Um, but yeah, any advice, just let me know. Okay, this is the first live podcast episode, so I'm not sure yet if we should be recording this part or whether we should stop recording. Um, let's see how it goes. But at this point now, uh, anybody can unmute and you are welcome to speak to Laura and ask any questions that you would like. Mm -hmm.